Good evening. Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ and our Good Friday service. It's rather sad that we can't be together tonight on such a solemn uh, night, uh, one of our my favorite services of the year, but uh, we are going to worship uh, the best we can here. There will be no communion this evening. Um, there will be Easter morning and packets are going to be uh, laid out and delivered and so forth. Information's already went out on that. Uh, there's a long scripture reading tonight and a very brief message, and then the service will conclude. So if you'll bow your heads with me for a brief invocation here. Lord, we come before you in the approaching darkness of our souls. We have traveled this Lenten journey overcoming and conquering barriers that have kept us from serving you. We gathered at the gates of joy on Palm Sunday and feasted at the Lord's table yesterday. But today is a different story. We witness the arrest and trial of the innocent Savior. We watch as he has moved brutally from the place to place to be judged by people who have hardened their hearts against you. The sorrow that we feel lies heavy upon us. Lift us, Lord. Comfort us. Help us to get through this time of darkness. Amen. The scripture readings tonight, I chose Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verses 36 through 27 verses 66, and there are some sections that have been left out simply due to the length. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not stay awake with me even one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him, with a large crowd, with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man arrest him, and you should arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those that Jesus put his hands on, his sword, and drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will not send me ten thousand legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled, which says it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going outside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, 
At last two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and have it rebuilt in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they have to testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will not see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard him say blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him and slapped him, saying, Prophecy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put this money into the treasury, since it is blood money. After conferring together, they used it to buy a potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been come to be called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took the thirty pieces of silver the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave it to them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded them. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival of the governor, it was a custom to release a prisoner of the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas, so that they had gathered. Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who you call the Messiah? for he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I tell you he has suffered a great deal because of a dream I have had about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor said to them, Which of the two of you want, to re- you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And all of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather than a riot was beginning, He took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it for yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole court around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, And after twisting some thorns into a crowd, they put a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him, mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. When they had led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man named Simon of Cyrene. And they compelled that man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he had tasted it, 
he did not drink it. And then they had crucified him. They divided his clothes amongst themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then some of the bystanders heard it. They said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, at once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints had been fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They had followed, followed Jesus from Galilee and provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Jesus took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had had hewn in the rock. Then he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other women, other Mary, were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that impostor said, that he will be alive again. After three days I will rise. Therefore we command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may go and steal away and tell the people that he has been risen from the dead. The last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers, go. Make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the message. The Passion story is a long one. It's a long scripture reading. It's full of trouble and beauty. And it's very old as well. Actually, it goes all the way back to Exodus, the book of Exodus which is why on that fateful day there were so many people gathered in Israel. They were there celebrating the Passover, which Jesus had celebrated the night before, the night we call Monday Thursday with his disciples. From the beginning, Matthew has sounded the theme of fulfillment, that the fulfillment of the prophecies of, Messiah, of the Messiah were all coming true in Jesus and this is a point that we've made several times through this Lenten season, that Jesus fit all the prophecies of the prophets of old. And here at the end, while we continue to recall the traditions that were filled, while we remember the blood that was spilled at the story's beginning of the Passover, we find ourselves now in Jerusalem. And the Jewish people will remember that God's deliverance of them from slavery in Egypt at the same time. The irony is that the Jews despised the Romans, but it was the Jews that crucified Jesus. 
When Jesus stood before Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pilate, the governor, Jesus was the one they con- was not condemned by them, but his own people. Perhaps the local religious authorities' obsession is easier to understand than the overreaction of the mighty Roman Empire to one small preacher in a far-flung province. That one solitary life that has changed the world. Jesus represents something more powerful than thousands of legions which he could have caused, called to save him. He represents the beautiful, terrible cross, that cross of hope. May Christ Jesus, for our sake, become obedient unto death, even death on a cross, keep you and strengthen you now and forever. Amen.